Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new, welcome to my channel. My name is Stephanie Yates. I am Buile. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And in today's video, we're gonna be talking all about solution focused therapy. If you're curious, stay tuned. All right, guys, so I have heard you, okay? So many requests for solution-focused therapy. So today we are finally doing that video. When I say solution-focused therapy right now, I'm gonna be pretty much mixing solution-focused and solution-oriented. I'll talk more about the difference between those two, but in today's video, there are so many similarities, it makes more sense to talk about them as a unit. So the buzzwords for solution-focused therapy are interventions like the miracle question, scaling questions, problem talk, and the roles of visitor, complainant, and customer. So if you see any of those phrases on your exam, more than likely they are referring to solution-focused therapy. In this video, I'm gonna explain what those terms mean. We're gonna talk about those keywords. We're gonna talk about the interventions, how solution-focused therapists view the problem, and the goals for resolving the problem. Let's jump right in. So solution-focused therapy is a postmodern model. We talk about the difference between postmodern models and traditional models more in depth than my very first model review, which was structural family therapy. The main difference is that postmodern models, they take into consideration the social constructivist perspective, which is essentially our realities are constructed by our own experiences, where we lie within society, what we've seen. Whereas in the modern or traditional models like structural family therapy, strategic family therapy, in those models that were the original marriage and family therapy models, there was definitely a view of health as objective, right? The therapist was viewed as the objective person in the room who could determine what health and dysfunction looked like. Whereas with the postmodern models, there's more of an understanding that it's not that clear. You've got to take into consideration culture, socioeconomic status, race, gender, so many different perspectives that impact our view of reality. And essentially, we cannot say that there's only one view of what's true, what's not true, and only one view of what's healthy versus what's dysfunctional, right? So that that is a very important aspect of solution-focused therapy being a postmodern model. Another important thing is that solution-focused therapy, as so many of the models are, is heavily influenced by the work of Milton Erickson. And that is evident even in the fact that this is a brief therapy. Whenever you see models that are designed to be very quick, and brief, as we saw with strategic therapy, a lot of times they are based in the principles of Milton Erickson. If you'd like a separate video talking all about Milton Erickson and his work, I'd be happy to do that. The reason I haven't done that yet is because he's not a self-identified marriage and family therapist. He's just one of the leaders of, I would say systemic thinking, even indirectly. So we could talk more about him if you want to, let me know. The major contributors or creators of solution-focused therapy are Steve Deshez, and Ensu Kimberg. And for solution-oriented therapy, the primary contributor is Bill O'Hanlon. The beauty of this model is that it's so simple. And one of the reasons why I think this model has persisted is because of its simplicity. It is one of the go-to models for grad students especially because it's a lot easier to talk about and to practice than some of the other more complex models. Now that's not to say that it's ineffective or that it's lazy or that it's only for beginners. Solution-focused therapy is actually one of the models that has more research supporting it than some of the other models that are a bit more theoretical because solution-focused has a good theoretical anchor as well as good technical or practical anchor, meaning like we have interventions and things we can do and know that that is solution focused. Sometimes the models can become so theoretical that you're like, okay, I love the, the theory of this, but how do I actually practice it? Solution focused does not have that problem. So the key concepts of solution focused therapy is really that just like it sounds, it focuses on solutions. There is this idea of focusing on solution talk instead of problem talk. So when we think about therapy, traditionally, we're a lot of times envisioning 
envisioning the person laying on a couch with the therapist sitting in a chair and they're going through all of the problems of their childhood. Sometimes we might imagine them unpacking dreams and things like that and solution focused holds a place for that. But the main focus is let's talk about what you want to do next. Let's not focus on everything that went wrong in the past. So that's what it means when it says focusing on solution talk instead of problem talk. Because with some of the models, you can get caught in that chat trap where the client just gets into the habit of just venting, venting, venting. And it could almost be viewed as unproductive because we're not really making plans for how to address the problems that they are venting about. There's a major focus within solution focused therapy on language. And there is a belief that language is what shapes our experiences. So when we focus so much on negative language, language or problem language, then what we're doing a lot of times is shaping our experience or perspective of the life happening around us and within us. And so by focusing on solutions, the belief is that that language can help actually shape your experiences in a different way. Here is the really the main difference between solution-focused therapy and solution-oriented therapy. When we talk about that problem talk, solution-oriented therapy allows for a little bit more history gathering and a little bit more problem talk to get a better understanding of the problem. The belief in solution-oriented therapy is more that we kind of need to understand the problems in order to create effective solutions. Whereas in solution-focused therapy, there's almost this view of, okay, you've done enough talking about the problem. Let's talk about what are your options to fix it. So these models are very similar in their approach. The main difference is that solution oriented therapy is oriented towards solutions, but does still allow for a bit more of that problem talk. Essentially that solution talk is going to build a sense of hopefulness. So the view of the problem and solution focused and solution oriented therapy is that you become stuck in viewing this problem and using ineffective solutions to address it. So you end up talking about the problem so much without actually having any effective plans to fix those problems. So what are the therapy goals then? To help families, help people identify their strengths, identify their resources and implement them. Instead of sitting in a position of feeling hopeless and feeling that you have no options for addressing these problems, recognizing your agency and being able to implement that agency to create and promote change. There is a major focus in the solution focused and oriented models on small attainable goals. A lot of times you meet a client, they might come to you and say they're depressed and you say, okay, what are your treatment goals? And they say to not be depressed, right? So to not be depressed is not really a treatment goal, but we want to say, okay, well, what would not being depressed look like? And we'll get more into this in the interventions, but just so you get an idea of what I mean when I say small attainable goals, you say, okay, well, I could see myself being less depressed if I were working out every day. Okay, so working out every day might be a really big goal, but what if we set a goal for you to work out tomorrow? You let me know how that goes. Or what if we set a goal for you to work out as soon as you leave from here? Just 15 minutes, 15 jumping jacks, right? Just be thinking of very small attainable goals to build a sense of accomplishment and start building that motivation and belief that change is possible. The therapist relationship to the client. So the main things to keep in mind when you're practicing solution-focused therapy is that it is intended to be brief. Solution-focused therapy is typically planned to last for only five to 10 sessions and really is very similar to strategic. It's kind of like a post modern approach, in my opinion, to the strategic model, which we talked about in another video. Let's talk about those three roles I mentioned at the beginning as buzzwords. So we've got the visitor, the customer, and the complainant. And these are three different roles that you need to assess when you first start working with the client or a family, okay? You need to assess how ready are they for change? Why are they here? Are they motivated? And these three roles will give you more insight into how to determine that. So a visitor in solution-focused therapy is a person who comes into therapy, usually at the request of someone else. I see this all the time with couples. You got the person who's coming into therapy because their spouse wants them to be there, but really they don't believe that they have any problems. So there's no motivation to change because they're like, there's nothing wrong. I'm just here to appease 
sees you. So that's a visitor. They're just here visiting us in our therapy sessions today. The next role is the complainant. They can complain all day about there being problems and they're probably going to point the finger at the other person a lot of times, but they do not care to, at this point, work to change those problems. And lastly, we have the golden customer role. That relationship with the therapist or with therapy is beautiful because that person not only sees a problem, but they recognize their role in the problem and are willing to work on it. They want to know what can I do and they're willing to try those things. Those are the clients where typically if you give them homework, okay, I want you to go home and write down five X, Y, Z and share that with your closest friend. They come to therapy the next session sharing about that experience of the thing that they did. When you have a client that is in that role of being the customer, therapy works beautifully and that's where you really can see brief therapy happening because you're able to work with someone who is working with you too. So those are the three different roles within solution-focused therapy. There are some techniques or different ways you can work with those three different types of roles so that the therapy can be more effective. With the visitor, you're probably going to want to give them a lot of compliments. Again, I'm getting this straight from my AATBS book. I always talk about that and I have the link for it in my description box if you're are looking for a study tool for your exam. But when you're t working with the visitor, you kind of want to give them compliments because that makes them feel more engaged and more connected to the therapist and to therapy. When you're working with the complainant, you know, you want to give them small tasks just so they can see the opportunity for change if they were willing to make some sort of change. And when you've got a customer, that's when you can get very directive. You can give them homework. You guys can do like the meat of the therapy work so that therapy can be as quick as possible. So one of the biggest differences between postmodern models and the traditional classic models is the therapist relationship to the client. So in solution focused therapy, even though they're there visiting a therapist, the relationship is collaborative. It's like peer to peer. And really the client or the family sometimes or couple, they're viewed as the expert. Why? Because they have had 20 plus years or however many years they've been alive of dealing with these problems. They know best what solutions will work best for them. And the therapist is just there to guide them and lead them through questions so that they can really come up with their own answers. So there are three common types of questions that a therapist will ask in solution-focused therapy. And these are some of the buzzwords that I brought up earlier as well. So we'll start with the miracle question. The miracle question is a great way for you to move a client from problem talk to solution talk. They might be talking to you about how they're so depressed, how they didn't get out of bed, and really just sharing with you their experience and why they're in therapy in the first place. And to help the client move from viewing their life from this very problem-ridden standpoint, you can simply ask, if all of your problems were to be resolved tomorrow, to go away, and you woke up, how would you know? What would your day look like if all of your problems were to be resolved? This is why we call it the miracle day, because most of the time, clients are more focused on the fact that they will never be able to get out of these situations or it feels impossible, but they never allow themselves the opportunity to think about, well, if these problems were somehow resolved, what would my life look like? And you ask them to get specific because clients will want to describe their miracle day with negative language, which really is counterproductive. So for example, I ask a depressed client, what would your miracle day look like? They're like, well, I wouldn't be depressed, right? Okay, you wouldn't be depressed, but what would you be, right? So I want to know from a behavioral standpoint, what are you doing? How are you feeling? Start me out. You wake up in the morning. What time is it when you look at your clock? Okay, so it's 6 a.m. So you're waking up at 6 a.m. on your miracle day. What do you do first thing? Okay, so on your miracle day, the first thing you do would be, you know, to go ahead and work out. All right, that's something that you're not doing right now. What else would you do? What time would you finish working out? And we literally list out that entire day. The miracle day can take an entire session to come up with. It can be multiple sessions. It could be five minutes, right? It really depends on how specific your client is able to get, which is really a great 
great estimation of how much hope they already have. If they can get really specific, there's a chance they've already been thinking about these things or they're really, really buying into this intervention that you're bringing up in session. So the miracle day is a great way to get a client talking about solutions because as soon as they say, for example, I'm gonna work out first thing in the morning, then I can start saying, so what's getting in your way of working out in the morning right now? And start building solutions. So that's how the miracle question works. The next question that we'll talk about are exception questions. A lot of times clients are so in the headspace that everything's a problem, everyone's a problem, they've gotta cut everybody off or they hate everything. You have to start asking questions about when certain things are not a problem. If they're saying like, oh, if it's a couple, it's like they're always cursing me out, she speaks down on me, then I can say, are there any times where she's spoken positively about you so that I can understand like what you like to hear? And that way they can start giving me examples because most of the times things are not absolute. And the fact that we can view things in an absolute way is actually a defense mechanism or cognitive distortion. I have videos on both of those things if you're curious about the defense mechanisms or cognitive distortions that we see most often in therapy. But nothing happens all the time. So exception questions are really important to help people have a more balanced perspective and recognize that these problems actually don't happen 100% of the time. So whatever percentage that they're not happening, how can we expand that? It gives you room to recognize the spaces, people, opportunities where the person doesn't feel this way so that we can do more of that. Then lastly, scaling questions. Scaling questions are very, very simple and they can be used in so many different ways. This is one of those things where whether you're practicing solution focused or not, you're probably going to ask a scaling question. And the same for the miracle question or the same for the exception questions too, but scaling questions especially because they help you put a number to things, right? They make things measurable. And that's really what you want to focus on in solution focused therapy is like I said, those small, measurable, attainable goals. So I can ask a client on a scale of one to 10, how depressed do you feel today? 10 being your worst bout of depression that you've ever experienced. One being you're completely happy, have no issues. And if the client might be like, um, I'm at an eight. And then I say, okay, what could we do to get you to a seven and a half or a seven? You know, what small change do you think would help in that regard? And they might be able to say, well, if I'm actually able to take a shower tomorrow, that might be able, you know, I seem to be a little bit happier on days where I can take a shower, right? And then you say, okay, well, why don't we make a goal for you to take a shower even tonight or tomorrow morning, write about it and let me know how that helped you. And that way you can start those little practices that can help increase their quality of life. You're able to do that. Or if the couple is arguing, you say on a scale of one to 10, how bad was this argument? 10 being, you know, you're in a space where you're thinking about divorce. One being, oh, this is nothing. In the next five minutes, I forgot about it. That way you can also see discrepancies because you might have one person that ranks it a nine, another person who ranks it a three. So now we can understand values wise, what are the main differences between how you two view this problem and why is it so much more significant to the other partner? Right. And so that's more of the solution oriented thinking, right? Because we're dabbling into that problem talk a little bit more. All right. So now let's talk about the process of therapy. There is a certain structure to solution focused therapy. In the beginning, you're doing all these interventions, asking those questions we talked about, right? You're gathering information about what's happened. And in the end, the therapist is complimenting the family and validating their efforts to improve their life for they're working with the individual couple or family. The therapy session always ends with some form of homework for the family or client to complete before the next session. The task that a therapist will typically give at the end of the first session is what they call the first session formula task. And this is where you ask the family, client, couple, to identify some things that they want to continue after therapy. What are some things that they like about their current life that they don't want to change? This kind of reminds me of the paradoxical interventions that we talked about in the strategic model, because in a way, it's a slick way of asking an exception question, right? Like your entire life or your entire relationship is not completely messed up, right? There are some things that you don't want to change. So why don't we focus on that in between sessions and you let me know the things that you want to persist 
throughout therapy and after therapy. A formula task can also be known as a skeleton key. And that just basically means you can use this intervention to a variety of different scenarios in therapy. That's another buzzword, skeleton keys, but you don't really see it that often. So, you know, just keep in mind, if you see skeleton keys, it's definitely in reference to solution focused therapy. And in those next sessions, the next question that you're gonna be asked is, what's better since the last time I saw you? Again, starting the session out, with an expectation that things have improved. This is how we keep our client talking about solutions, talking positively instead of focusing on problems and speaking negatively. And this can be very contrary to traditional models of therapy where you're gonna ask, okay, you know, what are some stressors that you want to talk about today? What's really been getting in your way? How, what can I help you with today? All of those things really invite more problem talk and those things can be effective as well. But in solution focused therapy, the focus is on what is improving. And therapy's over when everybody agrees that those goals, their problems that they originally came in have been met. So if I have a client that's coming in, they tell me they hate their life, they hate their job, they hate their city, and through our time together, they you know maybe get into a healthy relationship, they get a new job, they move to a new city. I say, okay, so everything that you originally came into therapy for has been resolved. What are your thoughts on ending therapy? Is that something you're interested in? So hopefully hearing these interventions, you can see how simple it can be to practice from a solution focused or solution oriented perspective. It's really about relying on those three types of questions and allowing your clients or the family or couple you're working with to figure out on their own how to fix these problems and providing them support and holding them accountable in the goals that you guys set together. So that is the overview of solution focused and solution oriented therapy. I hope that you found this useful. If this is a model that you would consider using or have some experience using, let me know your experiences down below or your thoughts. I really enjoy engaging with you guys. I thank you so much for watching this video and being patient with me. I know it's been a while since I've uploaded something, but I am paying very close attention to your recommendations and requests. So feel free in this video to also comment, letting me know what videos you'd like to see from me next. Again, my name is Stephanie Yates. I'm Buile, Stephania for short. I truly appreciate you for watching this video all the way until the end. That really helps me with the YouTube algorithm and everything. I ask that you subscribe to my channel and like this video. Share with a friend if you find anybody who might find this valuable. Thank you, thank you, thank you.